All right, all right. The title of my message this morning is The Wall. Uh, I would say I've never preached this before, but the truth is I preached it a little while ago. So um, I want you to understand this up front. We're only scratching the surface. Now, there's going to be a whole lot of history involved here, and, but you, we're only scratching the surface of what God is showing me, and, and I've got several months of research to do now. Yay! But, um, but actually, to be honest with you, when it comes to God's Word, I love research. So um, my theology is, and I know it doesn't agree with everyone on planet Earth, but my theology is the New Testament was written to confirm the Old Testament because I love the Old Testament. So... Turn with me, if you will, to Exodus 25. Exodus 25. I'll stand for the reading of God's Word. I did not bring a watch, so I definitely um, went over first service, which I don't normally do, but I did. Uh, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly. And his heart, ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins, dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for the sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. Miss Wendy, will you bless the reading of the word? Amen. You can be seated. I'm going to read a little bit more. Now, Exodus 25 is where we started reading, and this is going to be deja vu. I'm skipping over to 35, and I'm reading, but it's going to sound like almost word for word the same thing here in a minute. But I want you to catch some things in here, and then we'll move forward. Exodus 35, beginning with verse 1, says, And Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said unto them, These are the words which the Lord hath commanded that you should do them. Six days shall be work be done, and on the seventh day, or the Sabbath day, there shall be unto you a holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire. <laughs> that air conditioner is going to blow my pages. Throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day, and Moses spake unto the congregation of the Lord, of the children of Israel, saying, this is the thing which the Lord commands, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord, whosoever is of a willing heart. Let him bring it an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skin dyed red and badger skin and shittim wood of oil for the light and spices for anointing oil and for the sweet incense and onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate. And every wise-hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded, the tabernacle, his tent and his coverings, his tashes and his boards, his bars, his pillars, and his sockets, the ark and the staves thereof with the mercy seat and the veil of the covering, the table and his staves, and all his vessels and showbread the candlestick also for the light, and his furniture for the lamps with the oil for the light, and the incense altar and his staves and the anointing oil and the sweet incense and the hanging of the door at the entering end of the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with his brazen gate, his staves and all his vessels, the labor and his foot, the hangings of his court, the pillars and their sockets, and the hangings for the door of the court, the pins of the tabernacle and the pins of the court and their cords, 
the clothes of service to do service in a holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office. And all of the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. And they came, every one whose heart stirred him up, and every one whom his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and for all his service and all his garments. It goes on to literally say in this scripture that men and women brought things. And they brought things, and they brought things to honor the Lord. And they brought gold and silver, and they brought goat skins. And they brought everything to build the tabernacle of the Lord. And there's a couple of things we're going to look at here. It goes on to the point where the next chapter actually says, Moses says, don't bring any more. Now, I don't know many preachers that are going to say stop giving. But, but in this sense, he said, we have enough to build this. So we're going to pull up a picture of the tabernacle. Now, this is the tabernacle in the wilderness. This is the tabernacle that they used in the wilderness. When God led them, he led them from the tabernacle. God actually led them from the tabernacle. So here's the picture of the tabernacle. Now think about this. How hard is it sometimes to get to church on Sunday morning? It's hard to even get here on time if we get here at all, right? But here's what they had to do. They had to dismantle this thing and take it with them to the next spot and put it all back together. And they had to do this every single time. And if you read through from chapters 25 to about 40, even the ropes that are in there, he told them to twist them a certain amount of times. Everything had to be exact. But here's what I want you to catch about this tabernacle this morning. When God is explaining it, as I read to you from Exodus 35, notice something that he did. He did not say, build me a tabernacle, and then say, okay, now I want you to build gates to it. Now I want you to build a fence around it or a wall around it. Now, he kept going. He literally took the tabernacle, and he said, every part of this is the tabernacle. The wall is part of the tabernacle. The, the instruments that we use are part of the tabernacle. He didn't differentiate it. He didn't separate it out. It was part of the tabernacle. Now think about this. If it's us, maybe we throw up a tent and we worship God there. But he commanded them that you build the entire tabernacle and you make sure you build walls around it. Did you know there's walls for protection of the presence of God? See, the Holy of Holies, not everybody's in. Now, we are the temple of God, right? And I'll throw this out. This is not part of the message, but I'll throw this out. You have a Holy of Holies where you visit God. And then you have an outer court and an inner court. If you let people into your Holy of Holies, they're going to wreck everything. You don't want people in there. And if you let people into your inner court, let me give you an example of that. Jesus is an example of that. Jesus had himself, he got along with God. And then he had 12 disciples, outer court. But when he got serious about ministry, he took Peter, James, and John, his inner court people. He didn't just take everybody and throw them on board. He literally made sure that he understood that there was parts to this. The tabernacle had a gate or a fence around it, if you will. Over and over, the congregation come, and every single one of them was involved. You still with me? I feel like I'm going to lose you, but stay with me. If we picture Moses' life in Exodus, he was born somewhere between 1525 and 1369. That puts the tabernacle being built in about 1440. I don't have the exact date yet. That's part of the research. Uh, but about 1440. The common unit of measurement was a cubit in those days. 18 inches was a foot and a half or a cubit, 46 centimeters. In Exodus 26.10, he indicates that God ordered Moses to build the tabernacle. Well, remember, that's not just the building inside. That's every part of this, the tabernacle, and he told him exactly how to do it. The courtyard on the outside or the wall was to be 7.5 feet high and 50 cubits long. And he literally told him every way to build it. Now, you get the idea, right? You got this. Everybody still with me? Fast forward about 440 years, roughly. Micah, you got me a picture? 
to Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple, they talk about being built in the, in the Bible, was literally built to specifications. It had to be built exactly the way that God said to build it. And he built it after a pattern. So there's a holy of holies, there's an inner court, then there's an outer court. There's a wall around Solomon's temple. There's a wall built around Solomon's temple. So let me read you a few things here. Uh, the, the conventional dates of Solomon's reign are circa 970 to 931. This puts the date of the construction about the mid-10th century. 1 Kings 9.10 says that it took Solomon 20 years, but to build the temple itself, 7 years. It took him 7 years to build the temple. This temple was destroyed in 586 B.C. by the Babylonians. So somewhere around another four to five hundred years, I don't have the full dates yet, I'm working on it, but trust me, there's a lot of research to this. But it literally says that this temple withstood between four and five hundred years, Solomon's temple. Then it was destroyed by the Babylonians and they were carried off into captivity. Now what is the temple? It's a place to meet with God. So the first one is the tabernacle. Micah, can you back up one? That's the one in the wilderness. Holy of Holies, inner court, outer court, wall. The next one is Solomon's temple. And it is built, they say it's the greatest building ever built on planet earth. And it was destroyed by the Babylonians and the Jews were carried away into captivity. Move on to the next temple. What they call the second temple because they did not relate the tabernacle. But this is Ezra's temple. The second temple dates... HaMakadesh HaShani was the Jewish holy temple and it stood on the temple mount in Jerusalem during the second temple period between 516 B.C. and 70 A.D. It replaced Solomon's temple which was destroyed by the Babylonian Empire in 586 when Jerusalem was conquered and became part of the kingdom of Judah was taken into exile. This is Ezra's temple. How many remember talking about Ezra's temple? This is what was said about Ezra's temple. Well, it's never going to be as good as Solomon's temple. So they literally whined and complained until they stopped the building. But the temple was finished, and Ezra made a statement about this temple. Ezra said the glory of this temple will be far greater than the glory of the former temple. Now we know Solomon's temple was one of the greatest buildings ever built. Gold, silver, everything. It's flawless. And now here's Ezra building a smaller temple and he's saying to them that the glory of this temple will be far greater than the glory of that temple. Do you know why that was? Because this temple was not destroyed until 70 AD. This temple, next slide Micah, Herod refurbished this temple, and this is the temple that a 12-year-old boy spoke in. His name was Jesus. The glory of the former temple that God met with man in became second to the one that Christ spoke in because Christ is the Savior of the world. The glory of the new covenant is far greater than the glory of the old covenant. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. I'm glad for Christ. So during the era of Ezra, Haggai, and Nehemiah, Nehemiah was sent to build the wall around the temple, temple, which is now Herod's temple. He was sent to build the wall around it. This temple, Ezra's temple, was taken captive in, 19, or in 63 B.C. by the Romans. Pompey the Great came in and they took Jerusalem captive. Now we're going in four to five hundred year cycles. They led for four to five hundred years, then they were taken captive by the Babylonians, and then by the Romans in 63 BC. This temple is the one Jesus taught in. I've already told you that. Then in 70 AD, this temple is completely destroyed. In 70 AD, this temple is completely destroyed. Okay, except for one part. Now, I've given you four temples up till now. I've given you the tabernacle in the wilderness, Solomon's temple, Ezra's temple, Herod's temple. 
And in 70 AD, when this temple was destroyed, the Romans left one thing. Micah, the Wailing Wall in Israel. The western wall of the temple. Now, I want you to catch this. The reason the Romans did not care about the wall was because it's not really part of the temple, right? It's not. But in God's eyes and in the Jewish people's eyes, the wall is every bit part of the temple. It's part of it. He never differentiated from Genesis and Exodus all the way through. He never separated them out. He never literally took them and said, okay, that's the temple, that's the wall. He said, build the temple, the wall is part of it. So to the Jewish people, the temple wasn't completely destroyed. There's a 160-foot section that is still standing today. We call it as the Wailing Wall. You still with me? A brief history of this wall. When Rome destroyed the second... I told you you're going to have to think today. When Rome destroyed the second temple in 70 AD, only one outer wall remained standing. The Romans probably would have destroyed that wall as well, but it must have seemed too insignificant to them. And it was not even part of the temple itself, just an outer wall. For the Jews, however, this remnant of what was the most sacred building in the Jewish world quickly became the holiest spot in Israel. Throughout the centuries, Jews from throughout the world made their difficult pilgrimage to Palestine and immediately headed to the Kotel HaMarav, or the Western Wall, to thank God. The prayers offered at the Kotel, the Western Wall, were so heartfelt that the Gentiles began calling it the Wailing Wall. The Western Wall was subject to far more worse than somatic indignities. During the more than 1,000 years Jerusalem was under Muslim rule, the Arabs often used the wall as a garbage dump so as to humiliate the Jews who visited it there. Now I'm going to get into a little bit of earlier hi or, or current history, right? In 1948, the Jews fought a war to regain Israel. In 1948, they fought a war to regain Israel. One of the things that they fought for was to be able to go back to their holiest spot, the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall. Even though they won that, in 1949, the Jordanians were still in control of that area. And for the next 19 years, not one Israeli Jew was allowed to visit their most holy place, their wall, their wailing wall. Even though they had received and gotten Israel back, that portion was not there for them. 1967, the Six-Day War. Israel was still fighting for a portion of wall. We know that they got that, right? The question is, why was the wall so important? Because the Jewish people, the Israelites understood something that maybe somewhere along the way gets lost in translation. They understood that the temple was more than the temple. That the wall was part of it. Their hope was right there. Their hope that their Messiah would show up. That he would come. Their hope for deliverance was right there. And as long as they had something to hold on to. And they're still holding on to it today. The Jewish people knew the wall. Was as much a part of the temple. As the temple was. Fast forward to right now. Scripture tells us we are the temple of God. We are the temple of God. This is the house we worship in, but this is the temple of God. Still with me? Let me back you up for just a second. I want to take you one more place, and then, then we'll get into the meat and we'll be done. Have I lost you yet? Not yet. Good deal. Nehemiah chapter 1. Beginning with verse 3. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Nehemiah 
And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now I want you to catch this. I know I've said that eight times. It's a lot of catching today. The temple had been rebuilt for 50 years. And yet the people of God were suffering. There was attack after attack after attack. And when Nehemiah heard this and God began to speak to him, he said, this kingdom is taking attack from bandits, marauders. There's animals. There's, there's groups of men. There are gangs that are coming in. And because the temple is built, it's not complete until the wall is built. It's not complete. So God sends Nehemiah in to build the wall to complete the temple. And here's the crazy part. You ready? Ezra's temple took forever to build. The wall was built in 52 days supernaturally. God took every person and began to use them to build the wall in front of their house. Now, I want you to catch this. See, there it is again. That's my phrase of the day, I guess. In the, in the former temple, the tabernacle in the wilderness, he said, everyone with a willing heart brings something. When we get to Ezra's temple, Solomon had people bring it. Do you know Solomon's temple was not, it was put together on site, but it was built everywhere. They didn't even need hammers and chisels. They didn't need to hear the noise of it being built because every piece came in perfectly. Ezra's temple. God said it's not complete. Did you know that your temple's not complete and your city's not complete? until your walls built see all this while we're the temple of God but we're taking attacks that we shouldn't be taking there's still going to be an enemy there's still going to be attacks but here's truth I've shown you five different times five different times in scripture where the wall is part of the temple Yet we take our temple and we say, well, we meet with God right here. But we're taking attacks because we haven't built a wall maybe around the temple that God gave us and the creation. And it applies to our church house too. Nehemiah understood that the temple of God, the power, the presence, the anointing, the authority would continue to take unnecessary attacks until there was a wall built. When God moved them into the promised land, what was the first city? Jericho. They couldn't get into the promised land, the first city, Jericho, until God brought the walls down. And then they took the city. Israel fought the bloodiest war in modern times. 780,000 people in Israel at the time, and they lost 6,000 and 30,000 wounded fighting for a piece of wall because they understood how valuable that wall was. And here we are today, the temple of God. And I've skipped a bunch. I've got 16 pages of notes. Here we are, the temple of God and the house of God. And if we're not careful, we're trying to survive everything without ever building a wall, without putting up a hedge of protection, without building a wall. How do we build that wall? In Nehemiah's day, it says every man built the wall in front of his house. Every person built the wall in front of their house. If the church today can grasp the concept, my family's struggling, your family's struggling, because all I've focused on is building the temple. All I've focused on is what God can do for me. All I've focused on is my temple and me. But the truth is simply this. We are the body of Christ. We are the temple of God. And as long as I'm only taking care of, looking out for the temple, and I'm not building a wall around it, then the enemy will send attacks that he could not send when the wall was built. Every one of these temples lasts between four and 500 years. 
That's my generation, my kids, my grandkids, my great-grandkids, my great-great-grandkids, that I'm responsible for building the wall. We're responsible. What does it mean to build a wall? Next picture, Micah. What does it mean to build a wall? Manny, where are you at? Can you start right there? Stand, Brother Mark. Yeah, stand up, Mark. Just stand up. Bill, will you stand up? Miss Crystal, Danny. Just start down this way. Just the outside person. As long as I'm only building my temple, there are gaps between me and my neighbor. There is literally space for the enemy to attack my family. There is space for sin to get in. There is a space for fear to get in. And we wonder why God is not doing mighty, miraculous things anymore. But when we begin to build a wall, and we begin to say, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about Jesus. It's not about Manny. It's not about Craig. Go ahead and take hands down through there. We are saying to the enemy, I will protect the presence of God. I will guard my anointing with my life. I will guard my neighbors. And yet we get into church time, and it's almost like a house divided. And I'm asking God, what does this mean? And he said, you want to see me function fully? Then build a wall. Build a wall. Build a wall that will stand the test of time. Build a wall. And he began to take me through this. And I know you love this because we're digging in history. That you haven't seen the dates yet. Nero, Pompeii, uh, uh, even Stalin's involved in this. Joseph Stalin. This is, this is crazy and it's all in the Bible. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, God... Why have we never saw this? Why have I never saw this? God said, for such a time as this, if the church will build a wall and let it not be about you anymore, but it's about everyone. I'm not going to let my neighbors be attacked unnecessarily. I'm not going to let my neighbors be attacked. It's fine. You don't have to reach over. It's good. I'm just getting a picture. Church, the focus can't be on us and our temple. We have to build a wall. Imagine what God is doing now. What could he do when we bind the enemy outside the wall? When our time with God, let me just give you an example of that one. How many's prayer life ever gets messed up with things outside the wall? And I set aside two hours to pray and I get seven minutes of it in one minute intervals. Think about this. When we, the body of Christ, go back to the tabernacle, God didn't separate the wall from the tabernacle. Solomon, he never separated it. Read it, study it, look at it. He, when he said build a temple, he said build the wall with it. Ezra. God did not supernaturally build the temple, but he supernaturally helped them build the wall. They had a sword in one hand, a, a, a trowel in the other hand, and in 52 days, they built a wall that is still standing today in Jerusalem, Israel. And it's so easy to care about my family. But it's a little harder to say, I'm going to protect those around me too. I'm not just going to pray through. I'm going to stop and stand the wall. Brick by brick, I'm not going to let the enemy through. Because everywhere there's a breach, there comes a lion. There comes a bandit. There comes a thief. And God is wanting his people to build a wall around your temple. Build a wall with your family and your friends. This is part of that wall. 
first service, I watched people come in. See, for some, this is a good idea, right? You put lost people's name on the wall, and then you forget about it from now on. But I watch people walking in, and the first thing they do is they come over and they're praying for the lost people. You know why? They're building a wall around their city. Because without a city, there is no temple. Without a temple, there is no city. Without a wall, you don't have a city that is protected by God. And without the wall, you cannot, we cannot defend against the enemy. You say, God, is it all? I know that. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are enough. His part. My part is to build a wall. God put such a burden on Nehemiah that he couldn't even get up and go for days, rather sat and weep. When the church begins to build a wall that we are weeping for our neighbors, when we begin to build a wall that we are heartbroken for everyone around us to the place where we're not going to let the enemy touch them anymore, we're going to do everything in our power unless they climb this wall and get on the other side, I'm going to fight like hell for them. I will charge the gates of hell with a water pistol to save this man. When we become that wall as part of our temple, we will see God move in a way we've never seen before. Y'all can be seated. Holiness. For some, holiness is part of your wall. For all of us, holiness is part of the wall. But some of you, thank you, Jesus. Some of you are not struggling with holiness as much as others. But when we let our wall down, then our neighbors are under attack also. For some of you, that's compassion. You've been hurt so many times, you've lost compassion for those around you. There's so many things. But church, hear when I say this to you. That God showed us example after example after example after example. The timelines are going to be there for everything is going to line up word to word. But at the end of the day... It's about more than my temple. I should pray for his healing with the same fervorance I pray for mine. And if my sin is hindering my neighbor, I need to get it out of my life. Because God said to Nehemiah, build a wall. He said to Moses, build a wall. He said to Solomon, build a wall. He said to Ezra, build a wall. He said to Herod. Refurbish and build the wall back. So you be seated, and here's how, here's how altar calls going today. I don't know what time it is. I, I don't. I have literally skipped over a ton of this. I told you we're going to scratch the surface, but I'm going to be a little bit bold today. I don't normally call people out, but there's a couple of people that God showed me in my spirit, and here's what I want to do. Be honest with yourself this morning. If you're hurting, if there's a struggle in your life, if you're going through something right now that's a struggle, I want uh, Sean and Stephanie, when he comes back in, I want them to come up. We want to build a wall around you. I don't know why, but we want to pray over you this morning. Miss Betty, I, we're supposed to pray over you. I don't know what you're going through, but there's something that you need prayer for, and I don't know what that is. But I'm going to ask you to come up here and stand, if you will. And Stephanie, when Sean comes back in, will you bring him up? If you're going through something, I'm going to ask you to come up here and stand in a line. Not kneel down, stand in a line. And if you are a willing heart for those that are hurting and in need, 
I'm going to ask you to come and build a wall around them. I'm going to ask you to come and lay your hands on their back, or in front, lay your hands on their forehead, and you begin to pray for them as if it was your very life that you were praying for. And you ask God to place a hedge of protection. It's more than one altar service. But this morning, this is what God said to do, that there are people here that need a wall built around them. And it's more than just, and I don't know, Miss Betty, what it is, but I saw your face in my prayer. You know what it is. Come on, some ladies, build a wall right now. Micah, start some music. Stand with me, if you will. This altar, if you need God to do something, get up here now and stand in a line. And then if you are willing to pray with them, please, if you're one of those willing that is willing to build a wall, come and let's build a wall. If you're hurting, come on, line up right here. Line up. 